It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Gigabyte M32U. There's a written review, which this video is part of, or that's how I like to think of things anyway, and you can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. The written review goes into a lot more technical detail and covers some areas that the video review doesn't. The video review is really just to complement the written review and just show the monitor in action, really. Be aware that what you see in the video depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, and it depends on YouTube as well as the screen that you're actually viewing the video on. So in no way does it accurately represent what the monitor would look like first hand. Also be aware that whilst I primarily use in-game examples, I'm really covering areas of the monitor's performance when it comes to things like contrast and colour reproduction, which would apply more broadly as well outside of gaming, if you're just on the desktop, watching movies, that kind of thing. This monitor uses a 31.5 inch IPS type panel, an AAS panel from Inelux. That's azimuthal anchoring switch in case you're wondering. Yeah, a bit of a mouthful. And this has a 3840 by 2160, that's 4K UHD resolution and a 144Hz refresh rate. That's a 31.5 inch, or as I would call it, roughly 32 inch screen with a 4K UHD resolution. You get a lot of useful desktop real estate. I happily use this without any scaling, but you might want to use some scaling depending on your preferences. You generally get away with less scaling than you would on a smaller 4K UHD screen. And I know some people will be happy to use this without any scaling as I am, but either way, you get a really nice clarity to the text, really nice crispness to the text. That's something which the pixel density helps with, even if you're using application specific zoom, or if you're using scaling in Windows. That's provided that your application scales cleanly, which in most cases now they do. It's much better than when I first started using 4K monitors in terms of how scaling is supported by Windows and various applications. Most applications will have been updated to support this properly. When you're just browsing the internet, doing word processing, that kind of thing, if you're using scaling, no problem, things will be bigger, but you still have that really nice crispness to text from the high pixel density. This also invites a nice level of detail to suitably high resolution image content and that would include games and movies. There's an article on the website looking at this in a little bit more detail, 4K UHD resolution. That's linked to in the 4K experience section in the written review. But as you can see, really nice amount of desktop real estate. And even if you're using a bit of scaling, you still do get a good amount of desktop real estate. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So the screen has Gigabyte's usual style used for the M series, slightly gamery but without sort of flashy colourful elements or anything too over the top. You've got this angular stand base that has a sort of slightly plasticky feel to it. That's because it's hollowed out plastic but it does have a metal base plate and that adds good weight to it. And the screen itself as well, it's pretty solid. Again plasticky but has a fairly solid feel, it doesn't feel sort of too creaky or weak or anything like that. The included stand offers good ergonomic flexibility, you can tilt it, you can swivel it and you can adjust the height. It doesn't offer pivot into portrait however. And back to the design, mainly matte black plastic. There are a few glossy elements such as the step between these two levels of the stand if that makes sense. Sort of a little glossy band in the middle there. There's also a glossy element in the middle of the stand neck but otherwise matte black plastic with that grey painted on Gigabyte logo as well for a little bit of visual contrast. The screen uses the usual dual stage bezel design, so that means there is a panel border flush with the rest of the screen. When it's switched off, as it is now, you can only just faintly see that. And then there's a hard plastic outer part. The screen surface on this one is what I'd classify as light to very light matte anti-glare. So you can see a kind of glassy quality if strong light strikes it. You can see that there, that's bright sunlight. But this isn't like a glossy screen, of course, you don't get the same level of reflections there. In more sensible lighting conditions, you, you'd ideally avoid this strong light striking the screen, because that can have issues even on stronger matte screen surfaces with sort of more diffused patches of glare. So there's decent glare handling here, and the fact it's lights to very light matte impedes the image less than stronger matte surfaces, as I explore a little bit later. At the rear, you can see it's glossy black plastic at the top, and then the rest of it is matte black plastic. OSD controls over there, they're explored in a separate video, the OSD video. There's also a dedicated KVM switch also explored in that video. You can also see there's a cable tidy loop at the bottom. The stand attaches using a quick release mechanism, so you just push that little switch up and that allows you to quickly detach the included stand and that will reveal 100 by 100 millimeter VESA holes for alternative mounting. The ports face downwards to the left of the stand, you can see there's an AC power input, which means this monitor has an internal power converter. There's also a zero watt power switch next to that. You want to 
shut off power completely to the monitor. You've got two HDMI 2.1 ports, you've got DisplayPort 1.4, you've got USB-C, which has DP alt mode, 18 watts of power delivery and upstream data capability. There is a USB type B upstream port, that's your main upstream port, which is labeled SS for super speed. And there are three USB 3 ports, which are downstream. And then there's a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. There are also some upfiring stereo speakers, three watt speakers, which offer just basic sound output. They're explored a little bit in the written review, but they're not the worst I've heard, but they're certainly not the best either. They're just there if you need to use them. In terms of the capability of the port, you can read more about that in the features and aesthetics section of the written review. But basically the monitor uses DSC, display stream compression, for its full capabilities. That means if you connect it to a PC, you get 144 Hz by HDMI or DisplayPort with suitable versions. So that's DisplayPort 1.4, HDMI 2.1. That's at the native 3840 by 2164 k UHD resolution. You also have HDR capability on top of that and VRR capability in the form of Adaptive Sync, which allows you to use AMD FreeSync with compatible GPUs and systems, or NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode with compatible GPUs. HDMI 2.1 also supports HDMI 2.1 VRR. So if you've got a compatible NVIDIA GPU, you can use that as well. So you can use G-Sync compatible mode via HDMI. And because it's HDMI 2.1, you can also connect games consoles such as the PS5 and Xbox Series X, and you can get 120 Hertz at the 4K UHD resolution. And again, if you're more interested in the specific capabilities, the sort of resolution supported and the bandwidth and all that kind of thing, then check out the features and aesthetics section of the written review. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about the contrast performance. This monitor has an IPS type panel, so contrast isn't its main strength. I measured around 1100 to 1 using my test settings. You can get a little bit more than that on my unit, depending on the settings you use. It's a little bit stronger than some IPS type panels, not the strongest performance out there. It's also IPS glow to consider. So with this contrast as it is, and with the IPS glow, things don't look deep, things don't look atmospheric, particularly if you're sitting in a dim room and you're looking at darker content. And also darker elements within content, such as shadow detailing, that kind of thing. It doesn't have the kind of inky depth it might on models with much stronger contrast. So you can see the IPS glow that I was talking about in full effect here. There's a moderate amount of this. It's an average amount for a screen of this size. You can see it towards the corners of the screen, that haze emanating from there. It looks warm for the most part, a bit cooler lower down, particularly towards the bottom right of the screen. This can be brought out more strongly if you're sitting closer to the screen, if you're using a higher brightness setting, or if your unit has an issue with clouding or backlight bleed, which can also bring the IPS glow out more strongly. I also just realized that my keyboard light's on, by the way, so that strip at the bottom of the monitor, that's from my keyboard, it's not IPS glow, I'm just gonna get rid of that. There we go, really should check these things before recording. So the IPS glow does eat away at detail and atmosphere. If you're sitting in a brighter room, however, it takes the edge off that IPS glow. It also makes the weaknesses and contrast less apparent, so the perceived contrast is enhanced. I've just lightened up the room a bit. It's not a super bright day at the moment, just certainly isn't a pitch black room like it was before though. I know you're not always able to control your lighting environment in this way, and certainly you, you might be using the monitor in an evening with dimmer room lighting, that's perfectly normal. But what I'd suggest, if you can, is to have some bias lighting behind the monitor. So a lamp, it could be something like Philips Hue, there are other brands available as well, or lighting strips, something like that, to give you a sort of pool of light behind the monitor, and that can really help with perceived contrast, not just on IPS models, but just something I'd recommend more generally. Back to the gloominess now. Although there is detail lost due to the IPS glow, IPS models like this, they have good gamma consistency. So unlike VA or TN models, you don't get this loss of detail. So on TN, you've got a sort of gradient of detail from top to bottom for dark shades because of these perceived gamma shifts, even from a normal viewing position. And with VA models, you have black crush centrally, and then you can have excessive detail peripherally. On IPS models like this, it's far more consistent. Yes, you do get some loss because of the IPS glow, but throughout the central mass of the screen and just overall, things are more consistent in terms of detail levels. For brighter shades, there aren't too many on this scene, but just more generally, the screen surface, light, very light matte anti-glare, so it doesn't have a layered appearance or a clear layered appearance at all in front of the image, quite direct emission of light for a matte screen surface. 
It also doesn't have a particularly grainy look. It's a little bit grainy, I'd say, but that's because I'm quite sensitive to graininess. But this isn't an extreme or heavy or smeary graininess, anything like that. So most users are going to be absolutely fine with this element. The monitor supports local dimming. You can activate this in SDR as well as HDR. I'm running it under SDR at the moment. And you'll see that this black background, it's just pure black in paint. It doesn't matter about the application you use here specifically, but it should be pure black. You can see though, IPS glow, you can see that black depth isn't particularly impressive, but the dimming zone should be dimming a lot here. This is as much as they'll dim, in other words. And for this kind of pure black, I measured 0.17 candles per meter squared. So that's similar to if you just set the monitor to 40% brightness manually. Other thing though, you can't adjust the brightness when you're running with local dimming. It just does its own thing. I can't show you the dimming zones just by moving my mouse around. That's because the mouse is too small. It doesn't set the dimming zones off. It doesn't brighten them up. In other words, when I'm on the desktop, what I would say is that I don't like using this local dimming setting at all. Because of the locked brightness, it's uncomfortably bright. I would set my monitor much lower than that. I mean, some people might happen to get on with this brightness. It depends on your own preferences. But on the whole, it doesn't really do an awful lot because it's not particularly dynamic local dimming setting. As I showed you with the, the black depth, it doesn't really dim all that much. But outside of the fact that I've got locked brightness, where I do notice it as well on the desktop is that sometimes, especially if you looking at content on dark mode with, with a dark background or big areas of dark on the screen, those dimming zones will dim and you'll see it drag down the luminance of areas that should be brighter. For example, your address bar, bits of the address bar, other UI elements, and it can just be generally quite annoying. For games and movies, it can be more useful. They're very dynamic, but they do have intricate mixtures, and I'll come on to that shortly. I'll go back into Tomb Raider and talk a little bit about it there. But for the moment, I'm just running this, it's called Dimming Test. I'll link to this in the description of the video. There are several on YouTube, but this one will show the activation of the zones. You can see that they're reacting quite rapidly. I wouldn't say they're the most rapidly reacting dimming zones I've found. You can see there's a bit of a lag there with the, the large block and the screen stays illuminated a little bit behind the block, but they're pretty reactive. I mean, they're not super laggy or anything like that. You can see them doing their thing. I counted 16 dimming zones on this from left to right, so they're vertical columns on the screen running from left to right, 16 zones. And you can see that they are working. But as I mentioned in the written review, for some reason, when I had my AMD Radeon RX 580 connected, the dimming zones didn't do anything in HDR or SDR. And I've made Gigabyte aware of this. I'm not sure if it's a bug with that particular GPU, the drivers or something else. It is quite an old GPU, so I don't know if this affects all AMD GPUs and systems. But with my NVIDIA GPU, you see the dimming zones doing more or less what you'd expect. But again, they don't dim to super low levels. It never completely shuts it off or comes close to completely shutting it off, even for pure black. I'm back on that same scene on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and you'll see actually, although it's predominantly dark, there is a mixture, an intricate mixture of shades at the moment, some brighter, some medium shades, some darker shades, and you'll be able to see still that the depth of those dark shades isn't incredible. There's only so much you can do with 16 dimming zones, but also, as I've mentioned, they're not super reactive or super dynamic in this case, so it doesn't dim as much as it could. And this is really, um, I mean, this scene here is quite favorable for local dimming solutions like this even because you've got a central bright section and the peripheral section is much dimmer. It isn't pure black though. It does have some little details there, some sort of dark to medium shades which it's trying to display as well. But even so, this is sort of almost best case scenario in a game and even then the local dimming doesn't do an awful lot. And for the brighter content as well, because it's sharing the dimming zone with some darker content above and below it, it does actually dim that a bit more than it could. So it really is a compromise, and it does give a bit of an edge in places. So this scene here, for example, I wouldn't be seeing this level of brightness with this level of darkness at the same time without the local dimming. You know, things would look more flooded if you try to have the backlight at a level that produces that level of brightness, if that makes sense. But... Even so, as I said, it's not a particularly pronounced effect. And if, you, if you're interested in some measurements, there are those in the contrast table in the written review. And you can see there, it really isn't particularly impressive. It more or less doubles the contrast in very good conditions. But in most cases, you get such intricate mixtures of light and dark that it doesn't really do an awful lot. And for daylight scenes or predominantly brighter content, 
All I really notice is the fact that it locks my brightness to an annoyingly high value, and I don't really get much of any benefit from the local dimming itself. It seems more like a souped up dynamic contrast in many respects than a true local dimming solution. So personally, I don't much like it. Some people might like it. It's just, you know, it's a very subjective thing, but I've certainly had a more dynamic experience from some other models, even with just 16 dimming zones in play. I'm now on Legom, legom.nl, the website. I'm just going to quickly go through the test for viewing angles because I like to talk about colour consistency. So the Legom text test, it looks quite blended throughout the screen. It does have a green striping to the text towards the left and a red striping towards the right, but it doesn't have these saturated bursts of stronger red or stronger green. So this indicates a low viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor, perhaps more relatable are solid shades. Unfortunately, this pinkish purple block it does appear a pinkish purple throughout the screen this is represented quite poorly in the video it doesn't look like you'd see to the eye to the eye there's a bit of a stronger pink hue towards the bottom of the screen but it's not too strong and you don't get the kind of shifts you see on models with much weaker performance here the red block is a good striking vibrant red throughout the screen very consistent actually some ips models will show you a bit of dimming towards the edges here but you don't get that here the green block that appears a good saturated green chartreuse throughout it doesn't have any areas which have a much stronger yellowing slight yellowing towards the bottom of the screen slightly stronger yellowing but it's pretty consistent and as usual the blue block good consistent royal blue throughout the screen I'm now on Battlefield 2042 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. The strong colour consistency which I demonstrated with Legom is in play here as well so you get good richness throughout the screen. The monitor's colour gamut extends a bit beyond sRGB, uh, quite a bit beyond sRGB actually, but it's not as wide as some monitor gamuts. I recorded 87% of the DCI-P3 colour space, and I'll just show you that on the screen just to give you an idea of how it compares to sRGB and DCI-P3. So what that means is when you're viewing content like this, it's a game running an SDR, and if you're just browsing the internet casually or you're watching a video, that kind of thing, it's going to be created with the sRGB colour space in mind. If your monitor has a wider colour gamut than sRGB, it starts to invite extra vibrancy and extra saturation, so that's what we're getting here. This isn't an extreme boost of saturation. It does bring out some reds quite strongly, so the red of that car, for example, has quite good pop to it, but it's more saturated than it should be. This tree trunk as well has a bit of a sort of orangey red quality to it, not such a neutral brown that the developers would have in mind here. And you can get the same with some skin tones as well. They sometimes look a little bit redder than they should, a little bit richer. But again, this isn't an extreme boost, so you don't get sort of sunburnt looking characters. You don't get this really strong sort of almost Martian looking quality to patches of earth or anything like that. So it's, it's reasonably constrained. You do get some extension in the green region of the gamut as well, the green to blue edge of the gamut. This does give quite a lush look to vegetation. It still maintains quite decent deep greens, and I don't find that the bright greens are brought out in a super strong way so they look neon or anything like that, which they can on a monitor with an even wider gamut than this. So it still looks quite natural, but it does look a bit more vibrant and more saturated than it should. Same with the sky blues as well. Just a little bit of extra saturation there, but nothing extreme. So really this is a level of extra saturation and vibrancy which most people will quite like. It is very subjective though. I know not everyone likes this kind of thing at all. People would, some people would prefer things to look more as the developers intend, even if that's within the more restricted sRGB color space. The monitor does offer an sRGB emulation setting, which I'm just going to activate now. So you set picture mode to sRGB. This gives a more muted look to things. It curtails the saturation. It clamps the gamut close to sRGB. And I'll just flash up on the screen the gamut tracking now. So you'll see there's a little bit of sRGB under coverage and a little bit of over coverage as well, but it's not too bad. The thing is that you can adjust brightness with the sRGB setting, but you can't adjust the colour channels and you can't adjust gamma. And on my unit at least, the gamma tracking was a little bit odd actually. And you can see more about that in the written review, but basically it, it does give an uplift to darker shades, so it gives extra detail. It shouldn't really be there for some darker areas and can make things look a little bit, perhaps a little bit flooded in places. It also affects some of the medium shades and makes them look a bit less saturated than they should be. Again, this is explored a bit more in the written review. But aside from the slack of flexibility and locking you into things like this, it also locks your overdrive control and sets it to Smart OD. You might be able to see the strange shimmering around the buildings there. I'm not sure if this will come across on the video, but to my eye, I can see this very clearly. That is Overshoot, and 
This is because the Smart OD setting basically just sets the overdrive to either the speed setting, which is ridiculous, or the balance setting, which is often too strong, depending on your refresh rate. For this reason alone, I think actually many people will quite dislike using this setting when they're gaming in particular. There's an alternative if you're a PC user, and I explore that in an article all about sRGB emulation, which is linked to and also discussed a bit at the start of the colour reproduction section of the written review. So if you're interested in that way of obtaining sRGB emulation via the GPU rather than on the monitor itself, be sure to check that out. So I've just switched back to my test settings now, so the sRGB setting has been disabled. I would recommend, as I often do, you know, if you if you do do color critical work on the monitor, I mean, the sRGB emulation, it might you might find it acceptable. I, I would sort of experiment with the GPU side as well if you can, but ideally you would be profiling the monitor with your own colorimeter or similar device, and that would give you the best accuracy. You can use the full native gamut and then profile it from there. If you want to work within the DCI-P3 color space, to be honest, I don't really consider the DCI-P3 coverage good enough for that. You lose a lot of the more saturated shades there from the DCI-P3 space, and Adobe RGB, nowhere near. I mean, I discussed that in the written review. I can't remember off the top of my head what the coverage was, but you can definitely see that in the color reproduction section of the written review. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm running the monitor under HDR. I'm using an RTX 3090, an NVIDIA RTX 3090, but I did test using both DisplayPort and HDMI. It's very similar. I also tested with an AMD GPU. The reason I like to do that mainly is because games consoles will use AMD graphics hardware connected via HDMI, and I did test HDMI and DisplayPort on my AMD GPU. And things were a little bit weird under HDR because local dimming seemed to do absolutely nothing. As I said, it did under SDR, but again, that could have been related to my GPU. And also the saturation levels were a bit lower. Things looked a little bit less rich overall. I wouldn't say it was a massive difference. And this could have been partly down to the local dimming, although I did test with local dimming disabled on both my NVIDIA and AMD GPU. It wasn't side-by-side -side testing, I have to be honest, but just to my eye, it did seem just a bit less saturated. And although I'm just talking about one game here, I did test various other game titles. I also looked at Netflix HDR content as well, using the Netflix app. And again, what I'm talking about here very much is related to hardware limitations on the monitor itself, and it would apply more broadly as well. So under HDR, you'll see picture mode, now it says HDR. Well, you might not be able to see that, depends on the camera, it can flood this out, but it says HDR there. You can adjust overdrive, you can use AMD FreeSync Premium Pro, this means you can use adaptive sync, so you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, which is the one I'm using at the moment, at the same time as HDR, or you can use AMD FreeSync if you've got a compatible AMD GPU or system at the same time as HDR. You can adjust the overdrive setting, unlike the sRGB emulation setting, which locked that off. And in picture in HDR, there are various different settings here. You can't adjust the brightness, but there are things with enhance after it. I'm just going to go through these quickly. Under HDR, you're supposed to be following metadata in a very specific way. So as a purist, I don't like this kind of adjustment. You shouldn't touch it. But if you prefer how things look, by all means do this. So light enhance. You see that just sort of brightens the image up a lot. And again, I can see, you know, the appeal. Some people might prefer this look, but it also lightens up the dark shades far too much. And also be aware that what you see on the camera, it doesn't look as it would to the eye. So actually it looks a lot more natural with that set to zero. I certainly prefer it anyway. There's color enhance. It's a bit more subtle, I guess, but it's a saturation boost. It's now oversaturated things. So even the green of the vegetation there completely out of whack. There's dark enhance, that's just on or off. And that really just lifts up the dark detail and makes things look rather flooded, to be honest. Again, this is really not what you want under HDR or just in general. And there's local dimming. Now, I know I was a little bit critical of this with SDR, or at least not particularly glowing with my praise, let's just say. Under HDR, it makes a lot more sense. If you can use it, that is. I couldn't use it on my AMD GPU. With it set to off, the backlight essentially just stays at its maximum level, and it really just gives a flooded look to the image. The darker shades and even plenty of medium shades are just much brighter than they should be. There's just a, an obvious lack of depth. With setting enabled, it allows the dimming zones to do their thing. 
Now, be aware that when this is disabled, the monitor doesn't use or support dynamic contrast under HDR as well, so it really does just stay at its maximum level. And instead of using my preferred unit of candles per meter squared, I'm just going to use nits for the rest of the review because it's a lot easier to say. It's the same thing. So, I recorded a maximum luminance of 464 nits on this monitor with local dimming disabled, with local dimming enabled, 442. So very similar. That's not particularly bright by HDR standards. And also it, with local dimming enabled, it will get dragged down sometimes because it's not just going to stay at its maximum brightness. So in this scene here, for example, the dimming zones there, they're brighter, relatively bright compared to those. The local dimming solution works in quite a similar way to under SDR. The difference is that, well, the black depth doesn't change. So that's 0.17 nits at the lowest. In most cases, it's going to be higher than that because of the mixtures of content. So not fantastic at all, but still better than with the setting disabled, which would be more like, I think, 0.4 nits or something like that. Under HDR, you also get 10-bit color reproduction, which this monitor does support. And that gives you an enhanced nuanced shade variety. So these darker shades here, sort of little cracks in the rock. There's a natural uplift of detail there, a greater subtle shade variety. This is very different to a gamma enhancement that you might be able to use under SDR, for example, because it gives you this effect with the enhanced variety of shades. It's a very different thing. It's quite nice to have, but again, if you had more precision with the local dimming or more precision with the light source of the monitor, this would definitely enhance the effect here. The 10-bit color reproduction is also helpful for brighter shades. So, this scene here, it's fairly unimpressive by HDR standards, to be honest. It's nice that the 10-bit colour reproduction does its thing to help smooth out the gradient so you get smoother weather effects and the mist above the water, that kind of thing. It doesn't look like it does in the video right now. I'm not going to be able to show you this because it's not an HDR video and you may or may not have an HDR capable screen you're viewing this on anyway. But it just smooths out the gradients, gives you more natural progression of shades for these brighter shades, so that's nice. But again, the luminance it just isn't where it should be. The bright shades don't pop in the way that they can under HDR, and the darker shades aren't as dark as they should be or could be. But local dimming is again doing its thing here to at least give a bit of a situational edge and contrast. So the dimming zones here are quite a bit brighter than the dimming zones there. And because they're not super reactive and super dynamic, I suppose the good thing is that you don't generally become aware of the shifts in the zones because if you've only got 16 dimming zones as you do now arranged across the screen as large bands, if it's too reactive that can actually become quite distracting. I didn't find it distracting on this model even if I'm sitting in a dark room where this kind of thing can be noticed more readily. So it's good in that respect. I'm now on a different scene. I'm going to talk primarily about colour reproduction. So I didn't mean to sit down at the campfire there, pressed completely the wrong button there. And just before moving on to that, you'll see that there is an intricate mixture of shade depths here, and the precision just isn't there with the luminance control. So not only are the dark shades not as deep as they should be, plenty of the medium shades lack the depth they should as well, so things just don't look as rich as they could for that reason. The other aspect is colour gamut. As I mentioned in the colour reproduction section, I measured 87% of the DCI-P3 colour space. Now remember, under HDR, it's not sRGB that's targeted anymore, it's DCI-P3 as the near-term target, and longer-term developers will have REC 2020 in mind. So the gamut here, it falls some way short of complete DCI-P3 coverage, and way short of REC 2020. So the saturation levels certainly aren't as strong as they can be, but they're not too bad either. I mean, with some fairly lush looking greens for Laura's dress here and the vegetation in the background, and because the developers are targeting wider color gamuts like DCI-P3, the more muted shades don't have that extra saturation or oversaturation you get under SDR. So Laura's skin tone, for example, looks nice and neutral as it should. The fire there as well, under SDR, that can look a little bit over-vibrant, so too much of a reddish-orange hue. It looks more of a sort of vibrant yellow to orange here, as it should. And there's a good neutrality to the brown shades as well, and the reds aren't overdone either. There's a good variety of reds, and again, the 10-bit colour reproduction helps map things appropriately to the gamut as well. So there definitely are some advantages to HDR on this monitor compared to running in SDR but it's far from a true HDR experience, not just in terms of the saturation levels, but certainly in terms of the backlight control and the dimming solution as well. I'm now on Battlefield 5, 
not Battlefield 2042, just for performance and consistency reasons. And I've got the game running at a solid 144 frames a second. You might be able to see that in the top right, the little green number there. It might be very difficult to see because it is tiny and the camera would have to happen to focus on that element perfectly. But anyway, I'm making the most out of the monitor, so it has a 144Hz refresh rate, and I've got the content running at a good solid 144 frames a second. So this 144Hz refresh rate, it gives you more than twice as much visual information every second as a 60Hz monitor, or indeed this monitor running 60Hz. This gives you two main advantages. So the first thing is that it improves your connected feel. That describes the precision and the fluidity as you interact with the game world. It also helps to have a low input lag in terms of the connected feel. This monitor does deliver that as well. I measured around four milliseconds of input lag on this one, so that's not an issue. It indicates a low signal delay, which is the main element of input lag you feel. So most people should be very happy with that. The other advantage of this high frame rate, high refresh rate combination is that it reduces the perceived blur due to eye movement. There's an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness and a little bit of a summary about that in the written review, in the responsiveness section, discussing perceived blur as a concept. But essentially, most of the perceived blur you see on a monitor comes from the movement of your own eyes as you track motion on the screen, and that is reduced as you increase your refresh rate and your frame rate. The other element of perceived blur comes from the pixel responses of the monitor, so it's important to have rapid pixel responses, especially at high refresh rates where the requirements for a good performance are increased. This monitor does well in that respect. I'm just going to show you some pursuit photographs on the screen with test UFO. So a few things to take away from this. Firstly, I consider picture quality to be the optimal setting to use at 144 Hz and just generally at high refresh rates. I'll come on to lower refresh rates a little bit later. If you look at the images, you might think that balance is better and in practice, you might consider that better. It just depends on your sensitivity to overshoot. But what I would say is that there was more noticeable overshoot for some transitions not shown with test UFO using the balance setting. And I found this quite eye catching in places. So for that reason, I prefer picture quality. Also, I include two reference screens. The first one there, the Acer XV282KKV, that uses the 28 inch version of this Inlux panel, the same as the Gigabyte M28U, and it performs very similarly to the M28U, and is a little bit faster than the M32U using its picture quality setting, using the optimal setting on the 28 inch models, but only slightly, as you can see from Test UFO, and that is something which I would say assessing a broader range of transitions as well. Most users are not going to notice this difference at all. It really is a slight difference and the performance here with the picture quality setting really is very good. I also included the M27Q because that is a model which is quite a decent performer at high refresh rates but not perfect and it's still at a level which most users are perfectly happy with and yet the M32U outperforms that. So that's just to put things into context. This is a good 144Hz performer. The weaknesses, certainly on the minor side, that's what I call powdery trailing in places, just a little bit. It's generally where darker shades are involved in the transition where you might notice it a little bit. But to be honest, when you're just playing the game normally, I don't think you will notice it too much. And it doesn't add a lot of perceived blur overall. So it's probably not something that most people are going to register at all. So for the detail there and the darker shades there against the brighter bricks or the brighter sky, for example, some of those transitions are just slightly slower than optimal. And that gives you this little bit of powder trailing. It sticks close to the object. Sorry, I just realized my mouse cursor is in the middle of my crosshair there. I don't know what's going on there. OK, there we go. So yes, it sticks very close to the object and it's much fainter than the object. So it really isn't a major issue in my view at all. There's really very little to complain about in the way of overshoot as well, using this picture quality setting at these nice high refresh rates. It just, I mean, you know, there is a trace here and there, just a little bit. It's not eye catching. It's not really bright enough to stand out or dark enough to stand out against the background. So I wouldn't worry about this, even if you're sensitive to overshoot. Again, if you're not too sensitive to overshoot at all, then perhaps try the balance setting because it does speed up some of the pixel transitions a bit, gets rid of some of this slight powdery trailing, but again, most people I think are going to prefer the picture quality setting anyway. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5, and this scene has a lot of darker shades, so it shows these high contrast transitions, which VA models in particular are notorious for struggling with, but IPS models often struggle a bit with them as well. And really this is just an extension of what I was talking about with the darker transitions involved in the previous scene, same kind of thing. That's just a little bit more obvious here because there's sort of more of these darker shades. 
but again it's very slight powdery trailing really it's not something which most people are going to notice even for the makeshift roof there this is a transition which some IPS models actually really struggle with sort of producing more pronounced powdery trailing than here this one's really not too bad and again just keep in mind that M27Q reference which most people are happy with and this M32U outperforms that comfortably for these kind of transitions so yeah just a little bit of powdery trailing does add a little bit of perceived blur but really very much on the minor side not, nothing much more to say about that The monster also supports adaptive sync and you can use AMD FreeSync Premium Pro as an AMD user or you can have exactly the same experience as an NVIDIA user or pretty much the same experience, I'll come on to slight differences there, using NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. So that allows the refresh rate of the display to adjust according to the frame rate of the content. So I've just put up the refresh rate counter of the display, the FPS counter of the refresh rate display and you'll see that that isn't matching 144 exactly adjusting according to the frame rate of the content and that keeps things synchronized and it gets rid of the tearing that you'd have if you had vsync disabled or the stuttering that you'd get with vsync enabled but without vrr the variable refresh rate technology active you can use these vrr technologies by displayport and hdmi and because this monitor has hdmi 2.1 you can actually use nvidia's gsync compatible mode which technically doesn't use adaptive sync it uses HDMI 2.1's integrated VRR and if you're connected to an Xbox Series X you can use AMD FreeSync via HDMI or indeed if you're a PC user you can use AMD FreeSync via HDMI as well if you want to but it does its thing to get rid of tearing and stuttering from frame and refresh rate mismatches the range of operation is between 48 and 144 Hz with my Nvidia system this was the slight difference I was talking about for some reason I often notice this the floor of operation was slightly higher so it seemed to be 52 to 144 hertz sometimes slightly higher than that maybe up to 54 hertz it's sort of tricky to say but don't worry too much about this difference this is only a slight difference and in either case the monitor employs lfc low frame rate compensation so what this does is it it sticks to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate and that keeps tearing and stuttering at bay as well when you pass the LFC boundary, there is a momentary and very brief stuttering. It's not the same as the kind of stuttering you'd get if you had VRR disabled. It's really very slight. Not everyone will notice this. I do because I'm very sensitive to that kind of thing. So just be aware that if you're frequently passing the boundary and you're sensitive to it, this could be an issue. I've ramped up the graphics settings further, which is just to make my RTX 3090 sweat a bit more in this scene. And you'll see that the frame rate is now in the double digits, only just though around 90 frames a second or so, a little bit high, a little bit lower, depending on the fluctuations. With this though, Adaptive Sync is doing its thing to get rid of tearing and stuttering. I should also mention that when I tested it with HDMI 2.1, very similar experience, so there's no point in really going through that. It works in very much the same way there. But just to note that the monitor doesn't have variable overdrive, so that means that as your refresh rate decreases, which happens in a VRR environment as your frame rate decreases, there is a bit more overshoot, so I'm still using the picture quality setting, which is my preferred setting, and I'd say around here, 90 frames a second, there's a little bit of overshoot, but it's really not too bad, not too eye-catching, I just stick to picture quality. And also around this level, picture quality does very well. The demands for pixel responses are quite a bit lower than they are at 144 hertz, for example. I've increased the graphics settings a little bit more, so my RTX 3090 is sweating a little bit more. A little bit below 70 frames a second now. The overshoot does become a bit more notable, a bit more eye-catching. There's some halo trailing around the tree there at the left. Might not come across on the video, but to my eye I can see this reasonably clear. At this stage, you know, if you're spending a lot of time around here, let's just say below 80 frames a second, you might want to switch the overdrive off. Although it's off, it still uses a decent level of acceleration. As you can see with Test UFO, it wasn't slow, even at 144 hertz, it was quite reasonable. So at these much lower refresh rates, the demands are decreased. That offsetting works quite well. And that does get rid of the overshoot and it will give you a nice experience. So if you're spending a lot of time in the double digits, especially below 80 frames a second, I would just recommend sticking to off. I don't consider this for this reason to be a true single overdrive mode experience that'll fit everyone. So it's not like you'd get with variable overdrive, for example, but I think the tuning of the picture quality setting overall is actually very good. The monitor also supports a strobe backlight setting called AIM Stabilizer Sync, and they can use this with Adaptive Sync Active or with HDMI 2.1 VRR as well. As usual for strobe backlight settings, this isn't something that I like to talk about or go through too much in the video reviews because all you see is annoying flickering. It's really too difficult to demonstrate the advantages. 
you just see all of the disadvantages or some of the disadvantages. But I do explore this in detail in the written review. So if you're interested in that, check that out. To wrap up then, in terms of the styling of the monitor, slightly gamery, but nothing too outlandish. So I think it'll suit many people's desk environments. Nothing too fussy there. Good ergonomic flexibility with the stand. No pivot adjustment, but it does allow you to adjust the height, tilt and swivel. It gives you the 32 inch or so 4K UHD experience, which I'm rather fond of, and I know quite a few people who've tried it are as well. Delivers a nice pixel density for both work and play. When it comes to contrast, the monitor outperforms some IPS models, but it's certainly not outstanding in terms of contrast. It doesn't produce a deep, inky, atmospheric look or give you really defined dark shades, anything like that, but it's fairly typical for an IPS model. It also extends to the IPS glow, moderate level, normal level for a screen of this size. In terms of colour reproduction, good consistency from the IPS type panel. The colour gamut extended a fair bit beyond sRGB, but certainly didn't fully cover DCI-P3 and fell way short of Adobe RGB and certainly the massive Rec 2020 colour space. So it is a wide gamut monitor, but it really sits somewhere between sRGB and extended colour spaces. So it wouldn't be useful for colour critical work outside of the sRGB colour space. And the overall look, just using the native gamut, it, you know, it gives a bit of extra saturation, a bit of vibrancy. I think it's a level which most people are going to be pretty comfortable with, going to, going to quite like. It's not super vibrant, not super overdone, and it does give you a bit of an edge over your standard sRGB display. The monitor supports HDR. It's kind of, I'd say, fairly middling in terms of its HDR performance. It's quite broad categorization I just gave it there, but it does have 16 dimming zones. However, they're not particularly reactive. I couldn't actually use them at all with my AMD GPU, but that could have been a GPU issue. Not entirely sure. Worked fine on my NVIDIA GPU. On the HDR side, it kind of makes sense to have the local dimming because without it, you are locked to a high brightness and it really floods things. At least the local dimming gives a bit of a situational edge and contrast but I've certainly seen better local dimming solutions, even with a fairly limited number of dimming zones. And the colour gamut as well, it's not fully covering DCI-P3 and certainly not Rec 2020, so by HDR standards, fairly limited, but at least it does extend a bit beyond sRGB. In terms of responsiveness, not too much to complain about there, really. Good low input lag. Pixel response is pretty snappy, even using the picture quality setting, which is a little bit toned down compared to some of the settings on the monitor. The monitor also supports VRR, variable refresh rate technologies, adaptive sync, an HDMI 2.1 VRR, and that worked as you'd hope to get rid of tearing and stuttering. The picture quality setting worked quite well actually, I'd say until about 80 frames a second, then the overshoot became quite strong, but it depends on your sensitivity. It wasn't ever super strong. Whilst I don't consider this to be a true single overdrive mode experience, it's pretty forgiving in that respect, to be honest, as far as adaptive sync monitors go. And there's also a strobe backlight setting, which works with variable refresh rate active as well. and Explore that more in the written review, but it does work if you want to use it, but it wasn't really the cleanest performance I've seen. So overall, I really do think you get quite a lot of monitor for your money with this one. The sort of 32-inch 4K UHD 144Hz experience is nice. You get HDMI 2.1 thrown in, particular strengths with colour reproduction. Responsiveness is good as well. I think most people will be more than happy with it in that respect. And if you look at the retail price, I mean, it depends on your market, but the US price is around 750 US dollars at the moment. There's really very little that can touch it, in my view, if you consider the screen size an important part of your experience as well. I was also happy that it didn't have the issue that a lot of the 28-inch HDMI 2.1 monitors have with the overshoot at lower refresh rates, regardless of the overdrive setting you use. So in that respect, I think it's a nice all-rounder for both PC and console usage. That's really all there is to the Gigabyte M32U. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.